Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator. Come back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Roz Ryan from hey. Troy. Hey, <laughs> from Detroit. Oh, Detroit. I am so excited about this. Detroit. Baby, I'm Black happy. That's a Detroit. Yes. <laughs> Rock Detroit. Stop, Max. So, hi. Hi. So, I want to start off by okay. saying that we have a personal connection. Yes. When you were growing up in Detroit, my maternal grandmother, Pluncy Henry, would do your hair. So what was yes. your connection with my grandmother? They lived behind us. We lived on North Campbell. Okay. We lived on Parkdale. Mm -hmm. And our backyards touched. We had a little alley in between, but our backyards were there. But yeah. That was, um, I was, oh God, some of those memories come back every now and then. I remember this beautiful tree on their property that had these white flowers. Mm -hmm. And when the flowers bloomed in the spring, she used to let me come get them. And I would go take them. They were so beautiful. They weren't beautiful mm -hmm. after I took them, but they were beautiful on the tree. Right. But yeah, that, that I must have been seven, eight, Mm -hmm. Maybe seven, eight. Months. I think we moved off of North Campbell when I was nine because I remember going to junior high school. But I must have been okay. seven. Or eight. And so, how was it growing up in Detroit in general? What do you love about being from Detroit? What I love about being from Detroit is when I finally did go to New York, I was glad I grew up in Detroit because mm -hmm. I was strapped and ready. I knew exactly <laughs> how to handle New York because of Detroit. Mm -hmm. so there were certain th er, things, because in, in, in um, New York, it doesn't matter who you are when you're on stage. When you get mm -hmm. off stage, you get on the bus or you get on the train with everybody else. And right. people think about the limousines and stuff. Sometimes they don't provide that. It costs too much. Right. But sometimes, too, you want to get home because we spent half our lives in the theater. So we mm -hmm. want to get home in a taxi. You'd be in traffic for an hour. On the train, you get home in 15 minutes. Yeah. But what I loved was that it kept me humble. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a, a fabulous thing to be there, but it kept me humble. And yeah. a lot of that was coming from Detroit because I come from the nightclub scene. We were in the mm -hmm. bar singing and the men come in and get drunk and carry on. It was crazy, but it was so right. much fun and it was such a good education. Yeah. People ask me where I went to college. I said, I went to the US of D, the University of the <laughs> Students of Detroit. Right. Right. My dad I always talk about it. he because my dad got, went all the way up to pay PhD, yeah. but he's like I'm, I still got the hood side. <laughs> I'm educated, but yeah, you I'm can't take Detroit the Detroit side. out of people. You can't do it. You can't. You can take them out of Detroit, but you can't get the Detroit out of. Them. When I tell people I'm from mm. Detroit, sometimes they go whoa, and I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> whoa, be scared. <laughs> be afraid. Be very afraid. I also right. like it because. I was singing with groups and, and I had a group called Riot in Detroit. Well, I had a group. I was mm -hmm. the only girl for a while, but we had a group called Riot and I was singing with groups. So when I got to New York to do Broadway, it gave me that ensemble training where I okay. wasn't too, too high on my horse to sing with other people and to mm -hmm. harmonize. And you know, all of that stuff taught me before I got there. So what is the pronunciation of the group you was in with your, the Dale Cavettes? Oh or my God! Yeah, the Del Cavettes. Okay, because I was trying to Google it. I, I saw it on something else. I was like, I don't know what, how you spell that, but <laughs> capital D E L, capital C A V E T T E S. Okay. Everybody got an extra the L. In the Del, <laughs> everybody was L something or Del something, mm -hmm. and that was that was uh, we won the WCHB talent show, and mm -hmm. oh Jesus, in nineteen sixty nine. Mm hmm. 1969. Yeah. Dale Cavettes, green Nehru suits and white boots. That <laughs> picture is going to stay in my head forever. I have that photograph. Oh, nice. Yeah. White boots is definitely white boots uh, and green the Nehru suits. <laughs> that was the thing. Yeah. That was the thing. It was at the Fox Theater. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, um, like you mentioned before, or, you know, people usually, like Black folk, we usually grow up singing in church, but you grew up singing in nightclubs. So tell us uh, how that worked and how did you know you wanted to be an entertainer? I was, uh, my Aunt Lois was having, she had these cocktail parties on Sunday for her friends. And mm -hmm. 
I would go over and help serve. I think I was nine, 10. And I would go over and help mm -hmm. serve. And I was singing in the kitchen while I was putting stuff together to something on the radio. And she asked me to come and sing for her friends. Mm -hmm. And I went in there and I sang for her friends what was on the radio. And they gave mm -hmm. me money. And I said, wait a minute, I can make, <laughs> wait, now I can make money doing this? I was not really, I was a Motown girl, stop baby, from that point, I was a Motown girl at that time. I think mm -hmm. at about 14, my ears changed. I started listening to Sarah Vaughn and Carmen McRae and mm -hmm. Betty Carter and Lena Horne, mm -hmm. my mother's records. And I would go in the basement and we had this light at, at the bottom of the stairs, there was a light right there. And I would stand under the mm -hmm. light and I would have my pretend microphone and I would be singing. And then mm -hmm. we won the talent show. And when mm -hmm. we won the talent, there was Zeta, Zeta Robinson, Tony Robinson, my cousins and myself. When we won the talent show, it hit me that this is what I am, not what I'm gonna do, but this is what I am. And Zeta and Tony went off to do other things and I continued after we won the talent yeah. show. I was, uh, I think around the time I was 17, 18, no, I wasn't even out of high school yet. Uh, Orthea Barnes, hmm. we lost her a few years ago. Orthea was a friend of mine. She was a singer in Detroit. She used to pick me up and take me to the clubs. And I was like 16, 17 years old. And at, at that, back then, it wasn't a big thing for a young right. person to be in the club because there wasn't a whole lot of skullduggery going on. Everybody was kind of cool. It was about the music. Yeah. And she would take me to the clubs and she would let me get up and sing. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it became a real thing. And I started, I met Eli Fontaine, who was my manager, and he took over legal guardianship of me as far as me working in nightclubs. And mm -hmm. I had to go from the dressing room to the stage, from the stage to the dressing room, because I wasn't old enough to drink. That right. lasted for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I mean, I was working with um, um, McKinley Jackson, it was a club called the Mozambique, uh, the 20 Grand, Ben's High Chaparral. And then I really just started getting booked in these clubs. Yeah. And I started working. I worked those clubs until I left Detroit in 1979. Mm -hmm. And I was with a group called Riot after that. Uh, Jake Wade mm -hmm. and the and Riot. And then Riot disbanded. No, I left Riot. They didn't disband. I left them. And I mm -hmm. started singing at the Blue Chip 2. And when they got me for Broadway, I was at the Sweet 100 on Schaefer. And then... Yeah. Uh, that's, I just did an interview this morning and the guy asked me, he said, how did you get, get to Broadway? And I said, on a Cinderella slipper because I was singing in a club and Ain't Misbehaving was in town and a friend said, there's a girl mm -hmm. in the show that looks like you. And so I went down mm -hmm. to audition. I'd never auditioned for anything in my life. And I walked in and I said, look, I need a job. And they kind of yeah. looked at me and said, well, can you sing? I said, I, yeah. So I went out on stage and I sang and they called the producer, Walt, um, oh Lord, his name is escaping me now and I kill myself for that. But they called him and he flew in from New York and they all came to the club and they saw me sing and 10 days later I was on Broadway. Wow. Richard Maltby, that was his name. That is his mm -hmm. name. And mm -hmm. 10 days later I was on Broadway, but that's why I say Cinderella Slipper. Yeah, like, um for you talking about being in the clubs, I know um, when I was in New Orleans, they had the uh, maybe 15, 15 year Hurricane Katrina um, anniversary and Bill Clinton had came to speak and he was talking about how he used to come from Arkansas and sneak into the New Orleans clubs when he was underage too and mm -hmm. just be playing his saxophone. Playing his sax. And so it just, it just seemed like the norm back then, I guess, for little yeah, kids. Like, oh, I can then. play an instrument. <laughs> and with me, um, you know, there was no there was not a whole lot of crime going on. And mm -hmm. I was like the baby. I was mm -hmm. the little kid coming in, the band members, and all the band members liked me and they liked my singing and they wanted to play behind me. So I, I just got gig after gig after gig. And I was content staying in Detroit. I've been fine. But mm -hmm. uh, you know who Vondi Curtis Hall is? Uh, no. Okay, he's an actor. He's one of my best friends. He was in Detroit. He is. He went to New York and he kept saying, you got to come to New York. And I was like, for what? I got it made here. What are you talking about? But when right. I got there, I realized I didn't want to be there. And I left. I did 10 weeks on Broadway and I went back home. 
And then they called mm -hmm. me and said, would you come back? And I said, I don't want to go to New York. And they said, would you go on the road? And I said, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll do that. And I went on the road and I fell in love with the road. I mean, So I, why didn't you want to go back to New York? I didn't like it. Uh, well, mainly because I was big stuff in Detroit. I was I was the big fish in the little pond. And mm -hmm. when I got to oh, New York, yeah. I was just another one. And yeah. it was two, it was like four o'clock in the morning, people still walking up and down the streets crowded. And I was like, when do these people go home? When do they work? How could everybody be on the street? I right. thought it was it was just it was a little rough. It kind of made me mm -hmm. nervous. Yeah. Kind of made me nervous. And then I was out of my element. I didn't have any yeah. family there. And, but I made lots of friends and very quickly. And then when mm -hmm. I got on the road, we would take turns alternating and I'd go back to New York and they'd come out on the road and we made so many friends. And then when mm -hmm. I went back the second time, I stayed. Okay. Yeah. Um, so was your role um, on the television show Amen your big break or do you consider your time on Broadway your big break? I consider Broadway the big break, even though okay. there's less notoriety because it's okay. New York. If you don't go to New York, you don't see who's in New York. Right. Um, television, I had, I'm not sounding ungrateful. I had no interest in it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sing. And right. contrary to that, now I, I don't want to sing. I want to act. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of it's gone full circle because theater is hard. You spend yeah. half, well, three quarters of your life in the theater. People think, you only do two hours a day because that's all mm -hmm. they do. I had a woman once ask me when I was doing Dream Girls, which is a show that will kill you if you try to do it eight times a week. She said, mm -hmm. what do you do for a real job? And I said, this is my real job. She mm -hmm. said, I know you come in here and you do this, but all the time you have on your hands. I said, baby, you have no clue. We live in this building. Sometimes, right. especially on the weekends, you do five show weekends where you do two shows on Saturday, two on Sunday. You live in that building. Right. So I don't want to live in the building anymore. Mm -hmm. Not saying I won't if the price is right. <laughs> but I kind of, I kind of, the pandemic has done one good thing for me. It's let me enjoy home. Yeah. Because I don't think, this is the longest I've been home, I think, in the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only been like eight months. Yeah. Yeah, but it's let me enjoy home. And I know um, at some point you um, replaced uh, Jennifer Holiday, and I actually have a connection to her too because when I was going to, I think it was a re revival tabernacle, and she uh -huh. was married to the pastor there, and then my mom um, was friends with her for a, for a time. So um. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, Jenny's cool. Jenny's cool. We're good. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the people that I, I, I was the second replacement. There was another girl from the phone company because I think Michael was trying to discover somebody. And then okay. when that didn't work out, I, I was in England when they called, I it, it didn't work out. And I had been trying to get that job. Mm -hmm. And when it didn't work out and he got this girl from the phone company and she couldn't, she couldn't handle eight shows a week mm -hmm. because that's not for everybody. And right. he called me and he said, you win. And I said, win what? This ain't no contest. He said, you got the job. And I was like, okay. Should have gave it to him. Yeah, no. But only because <laughs> I come from the clubs and nightclubs had built that muscle in me that could do the yeah. eight shows a week because we didn't have understudies in Detroit. Mm -hmm. You have to go on and do your, and we'd go on sick. Um, and we did, I mean, I was at one point, I was working at two different clubs at the same time. I would open a show at, What's the name of that club? The Derby, Derby Room. No, the Rooster Tail. <laughs> Down on the river. You know the Rooster Tail? No. I, you don't? I would do the dinner, dinner set at the Rooster Tail and then go to the club. Mm -hmm. The Rooster Tail was down by the river. It was a fabulous night, dinner supper club in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm. Telling all the history. All the history. I know things. I know where the bodies are buried, baby. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and like, so, more. like, you're a, ugh, I'm an old soul, so amen. Oh. I'm like, woo, yes, that was a great show for me. Yeah, it I was, loved it. it was a good time. It was a good time. The guy uh, from Get TV, it's on Get TV now. Mm -hmm. and 
the guy from Get TV, I did an interview with him this morning and he asked me if I thought it was underrated. And I said, yeah, it should be up there with all the shows they have on BET and TV One and Aspire. They should have it. We did a hundred mm -hmm. episodes and it was a great show for a great time. And I'm still in touch with everybody that's still with us. I was on the mm -hmm. cruise with Clifton uh, Anna and I just did a theater piece last year by Ed Weinberger, who was the creator of Amen. So what are, what are your fond memories from working on that show, that being your first TV show? Discovering that I could act. Mm -hmm. He asked me, was, was anybody skeptical about me being a Broadway performer uh, doing a, a series? And I said, nobody was skeptical except me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never acted before. And I was like... Right. I, Think I could do that, but Sherman told me when we did the pilot, Sherman said, You're a natural, mm -hmm. and then he walked away. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun, it was a good educational experience. I consider Detroit was elementary school, mm -hmm. New York was junior high school, California was high school and college, and I yeah. graduated. <laughs> All honors, all honors. <laughs> Good night. So, um, yeah. So, how did you get into voice acting for animation? Well, this is a story about my musical guru, mm -hmm. Alan Rankin. I was in California, Pasadena, doing Pasadena, California, doing a show called Blues in the Night, mm -hmm. and John, no, it was, um, uh, Alice Dewey, one of the producers over at Disney, she came to see the show. I didn't know her, and she went back. Don't do that. She went back and she told John Muscar and Ron Clement, who wrote Hercules, to mm -hmm. go see this girl. And mm -hmm. they came and they saw me. And after the show was over, I was living in Florida. I went back to Florida and I got a call to go to New York to meet Alan Menken. And they said, if Alan likes you, you get the role of mm -hmm. Thalia in Hercules. So I flew mm -hmm. to New York. I went in the studio and I just did the, I read the copy and I sang. And he, gave me the job. My understanding, see Cinderella slippers, I got a whole bunch of them. Uh, mm -hmm. My understanding was that they wanted Nell Carter, Patti LaBelle, Whitney Houston, and two other women, because there's five mm -hmm. people. But Alan is musical, he's Mr. Disney. He wanted okay. Broadway performers. Mm -hmm. So he picked me, Lilius White, Benny's Thomas, Cheryl Freeman, and LaShawns. Mm -hmm. And we are the five muses of Greek mythology. Have you seen Hercules? Yeah. Girl. Oh, of course. <laughs> that was the breakout. That, that right. That's my, one of my questions. Um, how does it feel to be part of some of people's favorite Disney mu music performance? It, it, it's, it's so awesome. I get recognized a lot in the airports by my voice. If people mm. hear me talking, I remember I was in the airport one day and a little girl ran up. She said, that's Bubby. Because I did a whale named Bubby on Flapjack, Miss Adventures of Flapjack. And she heard me talking and she said, that's Bubby. <laughs> it was so cute, but I like that. It's a wonderful yeah. world to be invited into. Because I can get out of the pool, wrap a, a, a sarong on, go to the studio, go in the booth, do my work, get back in the car, come back home, get back in the pool. <laughs> I don't have to miss a beat. It's, you don't have to put on no right. makeup. You don't have to get dressed up. You just go in there and it's fun. I know I just did mm -hmm. lipstick on my teeth, but it's fun. It's a lot mm -hmm. of fun being in the studio. You, there's no, there's no top. There's no cap. You have to right. go all the way out and let them pull you back if they want okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Most of the time, it's no cap. I've been with my last one, Mighty Magic, Magic, Mighty Magic Words. I think Mighty Magic mm -hmm. Words. I'm a tree. A talking <laughs> yeah. tree. Mm -hmm. I've been a few things. I've been a blue whale. I've been a tree. Yeah, let's go through it. So you was um you had the brave little toaster to the rescue. You did some voices there. Hercules, the whole the movie, the video game TV series, Buzz Lightyear of Star Command TV series. You're Madam President. Kim Possible, your Wade's mom. The marvelous misadventures of Flapjack, your Bubby. Uh, Scooby Doo. You did one episode. Mystery Incorporated was gorgeous. G. Uh, kick. Butkowski, Butkowski, Bik, <laughs> that's a tongue twister. Um, Kick Butkowski, sub suburban dark daredevil, Mrs. Fr you are Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Uh, the Looney Tunes show, your witch Lisa, which is like a, a continuation witch of the witch Hazel. Hazel. Yeah. yeah, 
Um, and then Teen Titans Go, your cyborg's grandma voice. For, and then um, Adventure Time, your Cake the Cat. Cake the Cat. And then Mighty Ma- Magic Words, Steel Magnolia. Yeah. And among other things, I just listed like uh, some highlights. <laughs> I love the voiceover industry. I tried to get in it for um, jingles, for singing. Okay. And, 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 you know, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plan. Right. My life has been a series of gifts from God that I had no idea that I was going to be doing. So That's why I try to write down the most miraculous things so God can laugh at me and do bigger. Like, oh, right. let me just put this, the biggest idea I could think of. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm having my book written now. I can't write. I can't dictate. Mm-hmm. I have to be stimulated to speak. And then once you stimulate me to speak, you want me to shut up because I talk a lot and I got a lot of history up in here. So Mm -hmm. a friend of mine, when we were in Korea, uh, one of the uh, performers in Chicago, Corey, we became very good friends and he's an excellent writer. So he's writing my book. So we've had so many sessions sitting and because Corey is a friend, I'm telling him everything. I'm not changing any names. Everybody's going down. All the mad days in Detroit, they're going down. The ones that are still alive, they're going down. I can't help it because I can't tell the story right if I tell a lie. Mm-hmm. I'm telling everything. I'm not changing any names. I'm omitting a couple of names. Mm-hmm. Some people have families and jobs and stuff, and they don't want to lose them. But we right. had a lot of fun back in the day. I'm we sure. Had a whole lot of fun. Wow. Man, crazy. people could have way more fun before cameras and social media. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but now you got to be real careful what you say and who you say it to. But it's mm-hmm. it's not a whole lot of diabolical stuff. It's it's all fun stuff, but it was Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Yeah. I ain't had so no. something Right. So something that I've heard is that um voice acting is harder than regular acting. Do you agree with that? Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. No, because you're in the booth by yourself Mm -hmm. and there's no top. There's nobody watching you. You don't have to worry about if your straps are showing and uh, (laughs) as far as the, and you're not acting. Well, sometimes we did go in the booth with other people, but it it just, mine doesn't ever get serious. It's always fun. All the voiceovers I've done have been fun. Okay. The fascinating thing is one time I was in, I was in Philly. LaShawn's was here in Cali and Lilius was in New York and we were all in here. Mm -hmm. And we did a whole song with us being in different states. The technology Mm -hmm. is fascinating. And I don't think it's hard. I don't think Mm -hmm. it's hard. I think it's hard. Because you're awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, baby. I think it's, it's not harder because you don't have to move. You don't have to be on a mark. You don't have to think about anything except what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you really don't have to think too hard on that. They call mm-hmm. me one take mama because I can go in a studio and they'll book three hours and I'll be out in an hour. Nice. They'll book two hours. I'll be out in 30 minutes because <laughs> I love it so much. I just go in and hit it. Mm-hmm. They say um, I'm good. At it. Yeah, I believe you. So what has been your uh, favorite animated project that you've worked on? Hercules has to be my favorite. Mm -hmm. Absolute favorite. Because of of the incorporation of the singing and the acting and the story itself and working with Alan Menken is a dream. It's Mm -hmm. a dream. He is truly my musical guru. Mm -hmm. I run into him. We did a tribute to him at Carnegie Hall a year and a half ago. And all of the Disney shows that he's written, the music, everybody was there, including Angela Lansbury. And she wow. was 90 something years old. And she sang the theme to Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. And didn't miss a word. We were in awe of her. And it was flattering because she was in awe of us. Mm-hmm. And it was just so wonderful to do that for him. And he's the kind of guy I ran into him in the airport one day. I was leaving California, he was coming in and I had my back turned and he came over and tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and we laughed and hugged. And he said, what are you doing? I'm doing something at the Hollywood Bowl. Why don't you come? And I said, I'm on my way to Vegas. <laughs> I got to go, <laughs> I got to go visit my money. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. But he's, he's just a, such a great guy. And that was a wonderful experience. That's the beginning of the animation career. 
Mm-hmm. That was a wonderful experience. That's the best one. Bubby yeah. is the second best. Why? What do you like about Bubby? I've just loved her. And Bubby mm-hmm. was supposed to be a boy. Oh, okay. But I auditioned for it and Thur- Von Orman said, okay, I like her. And he gave mm-hmm. me the job. But I liked the relationship between Bubby and Flapjack so much. Because mm-hmm. she was sweet. She mm-hmm. was very nice and she was very sweet. And I like her. I got yeah. a little bit of that in me. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Nighty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what are your tips for how people can approach the skill of voice acting? Because some people, you know, they might get nervous in there, or they might, I don't know. What What do you think um, for beginners? Like, what? How can they approach voice acting? You mean after they get the job, or trying to get the job? Both. Both. Okay. In trying to get the job, I would say put a reel together, a vocal reel Mm -hmm. of different colors of your voice Mm -hmm. and just submit it to as many, you would send it to voiceover agents, as many as you could. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult business to get into. It's really hard. That's why I'm telling you that Cinderella slipper, she's been fitting me for a long time. It's hard to get into. Um, I was ushered in by God. I have no other way to say it. It was just mm-hmm. I had an opportunity to audition for something. That's the first thing. It's an opportunity. And then right. to audition for it and get it. And then once you get in, you're in. Okay. Most of the time, they will call you for other things. Because when they did the Hercules TV show, they called us. And when they did another show, I'm trying to think of which show that was. Uh, Jamie, which show was that? Well, when I went in... I was called by Disney. I did Disney for a long time. And when I went in, I was told that they were using some of the voices from The Simpsons, but they had begun to outprice themselves. Mm. Because, see, it's not the fee for the session. It's the residuals. Oh, yeah. You don't go in there going crazy about the fee for the session. You go in there for the mailbox money. That money (laughs) is coming to your house after you've done this job. And I learned Mm. that from Patty Austin. Okay. But I would say, um, as far as getting nervous, nervous is natural. Mm-hmm. You just have to decide what kind of nervous you're going to have. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, my nervous is, to be blunt, I have to pee before I go on stage. But when mm-hmm. I get on stage, I forget. I don't have to. But mm-hmm. that's my nervous. And I discovered that because it always happens. It's like, why didn't I go to the bathroom? And then I think about it and say, well, this happens all the time. And I really don't have to go. It's just my right. nerves. Mm-hmm. Uh, auditioning, my thing is to just kind of picture everybody that's looking at you. Picture them naked. Just picture them with no clothes on. And it takes mm-hmm. the fear out because it's vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know who's sitting at a table when you audition. It could be uh, the producer. It could be the person that gets the coffee. You have no idea who's sitting mm-hmm. there. So I just picture him naked. Sherman used that I in see the, that because the series of Amen. He used that in, uh, Ed Weinberger used that in Amen one day. Mm-hmm. He, I think it was uh, going to court and picturing the mm-hmm. jury naked or something. So I don't remember how he used it, but he used it. But um, it, nerves are natural. It's natural. You just got to yeah. figure out how much of it you're going to let it overtake your ability to do what you came to do. Yeah, like when I um, applied for a previous position, <clears throat> they had a bunch of people in there and I got the job. And then I don't know how how long it took me to like think back on it, but I was like, he not even in our department. They just put not him in even, there. But they put him in there to intimidate. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I say later on down the line, about six months down the line, they on Prozac telling you all the problems. <laughs> and this is the same person that intimidated you when you walked in the door. So just cut the intimidation. It's, yeah. it's people are people. Right. And, and nobody is any more important than anybody else. Nobody. Right. So they're just, we're all on the same level, regardless if we feel that way or if we are willing to admit it. We're mm-hmm. all on the same level. We're all human. Right. So you human too. <laughs> I mean, really, you walk in, I used to go into audition rooms and when I finished, I would say, why don't y'all tell me what y'all gonna say when I leave? Mm-hmm. And they would laugh. Because I'd be like, I know you're going to talk about me, so why don't you just tell me now? Instead, mm-hmm. I remember, um, who was it, Marco, Marco Panette, uh, all about the Andersons, the show I did with Anthony mm-hmm. Anderson. Marco yeah. was the executive producer. I flew in from New York to audition, and 
No, I auditioned in New York. Then I flew in for the network audition. And when I came to the network audition, I had to fly back to New York to be on stage that night. So mm -hmm. on my way to the airport, Marco called me in the car and said, I'm not going to let you get on that plane and wonder if you got this job, you got it. And I nice. thought that was the kindest thing that anybody could do. I'll never forget that. And I go mm -hmm. to parties every year. <laughs> he did that. He's a great guy. Yeah. But people mm -hmm. are just people. And a right. lot of times, you know, auditioning can be intimidating. That first gig, when you get in the room on voiceovers, you end up by yourself. Relax. Mm -hmm. and do your thing. Yeah. Just say nothing around you but glass. Just relax and do your thing. And never take the fun out. Yeah. Keep the fun in all the time. All the time. Keep you sane. Well, I'm mm -hmm. not the same. <laughs> I'm, we love I'm, you anyway. Thank you, baby. I'm on the borderline of saying, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just be true to yourself and just don't let nobody knock you off your your, your hole, your pole. Just mm -hmm. knock you off the pole. Did I just say that? <laughs> well, hey, you, was you listening to WAP before this? <laughs> I don't know, but that too. Don't let nobody knock me. <laughs> no, no, no. Your ears are bougie. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Wait, you ain't said nothing but a word. Where my hat? <laughs> Where my hat? You ain't said nothing but a word, girl. See, you know me already. Because <laughs> I make announcements. <laughs> Hashtag bougie. There she is. I'm health. Yes, he is. Oh, I'm just like Wendy about the hair. Mm -hmm. You see, I got some notes up in here too. Mm -hmm. Hashtag always bougie. And I don't think bougie is a negative thing. I think that we mm -hmm. need bougie is, is keeping some semblance of class. And that, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, I always say I'm 10 to 15 years younger than what you think, or I'm 10 to 15 years older than what older you think. Older than what you think. I like that. <laughs> And I'm 10 to 15 years younger than what they say. <laughs> you see, but television that told on me, y'all know I've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I was, um, when I went to Broadway, I was 27 paying 17. Effie was okay. 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me, would you ever do Dream Girls again? I said, who would I play? <laughs> Sometimes people say the darndest things. Right, they don't be thinking. They don't be now, thinking. To go, to go back to talk about Hollywood, I know you said in the intimidation factor, I know you said before that everything about Hollywood is intimidation, right? Yeah. It's and set so up that way. Not only the auditioning, but just everything involved. Going to the store is intimidating in Hollywood. <laughs> everything, because I had a woman stop in the grocery store one day and say, how come you don't have on no makeup? And I said, why, why should I have on makeup? Well, you know, you're a celebrity and we look at you and we expect you to be beat. I said, well, Miss Thing, listen, I had to go to the grocery store and it's hot outside and ain't nobody paying me to put on no makeup. So now if you find somebody want to pay me, I'll go home and whip my face. I'll do it real quick. And she laughed, of course, but it's just the, the things that they say. It's like, um, they asked me, a woman asked me one time, it doesn't look like you and your sister really get along, talking about Barbara Montgomery. Who mm -hmm. played I said, I love my sister on and off camera. So, right. which, well, you know, y'all bicker on camera. I said, we're acting. <laughs> right. <laughs> but sometimes I had a woman literally slap my face in the airport at baggage claim. She had sent her child up to ask me if I was who she thought I was. And mm -hmm. the young kid, about 10, came over and asked me, was I on Amen? And I said, yeah. And I said, who put you up to this? And he said, my mama. And I went over to her and I said, why you want to send the bill? And I talk like this to people. I said, why you want to send the bill over here to ask me and who I, why don't you come over here and say hi? And she said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, bam. And I said, Miss Thang, what? She said, I'm so sorry. I get just I'm so excited. I said, well, next time you get excited, put your hands in your pocket. <laughs> right. People just say, they say things sometimes that just make you go, bless your heart. I know your grandma taught you that one. Bless your right. heart. Right. Mm -hmm. That's when you want to mm -hmm. really just go off and you just, bless your heart. 
And then living in New Orleans, I just be like, oh yeah, bless your heart. <laughs> yeah. I love New Orleans. Mm -hmm. What kind of animated project would you love to lend your voice to, if you if you could think of? Hmm. I'm, there's no particular kind because everyone that I've done has been different. I mean, playing a whale in a tree. Mm -hmm. um, I just <laughs> love all of it. I would do any anything. Usually when they call me, um, there was one, I think it was Cyborg's grandmother. When I went in, I said, um, how old is she? And the producer said, it's you. And I said, <laughs> oh, just, just me naturally. And he said, yeah, it's you. Just talk like you talk <laughs> because I was looking right. sometimes I've, I've done a child's voice. I've done an yeah. older voice and you change the voice up with the character. So mm -hmm. I have to see the character first to know exactly what I want to do with it. Right. So I don't know if I would want to, I, I can't think of what could I, if I had an option to just say, I want to do so-and-so in animation and somebody just said, okay, we'll back it and we'll pay for it and we'll get the studio, come on in and do it. What would it be? It would probably be, oh, I just had a brilliant idea. I would love to do the, the women I spoke of, Carmen mm -hmm. McRae, Betty Carter, Sarah Vaughn, Lena Horne, those women preparing for a show. Mm and do their, their lives back, you know, the back life that nobody gets to see, yeah. mm -hmm. deal with the person. But then again, that would not probably not appeal to children. So that's why I say, I don't know which one. I am an advocate for animation being for adults. You know, they do that all in Europe and stuff where yeah. it's, it's just a medium in Europe and other parts of the world. But because of, I feel like because of capitalism and being able to sell toys and yeah. backpacks and lunch boxes, that's why it's been for kids in America. But there's more um, stuff coming out for adults now. More but I'm like a big advocate. Yeah, these fighting mm -hmm. games and the vicious games and the blood games that oh, lead yeah. from the from the babies to laugh to the toddler to the um, teens to fight and shoot and kill. That's the animation world, except for mm -hmm. the, the stuff in between. Is what you see on television. What we're allowed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we need some more animation geared toward adults because yeah. adults need to laugh. They need to keep laughing. Yeah. But things ain't funny right now. Right. You know, so just some, some humor. But I think I would love to do uh, some very strong black women. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'd like I like to that do. idea. Yeah. Anybody out there? Listening? You listening? No, they're going to say- got the money. Say, no, she too crazy. <laughs> 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 but that, yeah, that'd be a great idea. I had to think about that for a minute, but that would be cool. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Uh, so, uh, a couple land yap. I learned that in New Orleans. Questions, some extra questions that I thought of. Land so yap. I saw. Yeah, that means extra, like a yeah, little bonus. Land yap, I like that. So I saw some clips of you um, on the game sh show uh, Super Password. <laughs> like, do people do people want to be your uh, partner at ga on game night? Yes, Lord have mercy. Yes, they do. I won. I think maybe five or six different people got them $10,000. One of the girls, this is really ironic. I was at the Federal, there's a club here on Lancashire. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And I was at this club watching a friend of mine perform. And there was a woman and a man sitting behind me. And I heard the man. Mm -hmm. The man said, I think that is Roz. <laughs> And I turned around and I said, it's me. I said, y'all be talking like you said, I can't hear you. <laughs> and his wife's name is Cindy. Mm -hmm. Cindy turned around and looked at me and she hugged me and she said, you helped me buy my first house. Oh, and I wow. said, no. She said, super password. I won $10,000. You helped me buy my first house in 1983. Wow. I love those game shows. I had Man, with the one the the clip I was watching where it was like um, Honda Kamikaze, I like Japan. <laughs> your partner just wasn't getting. I was like, it is Japan. <laughs> I know, I know. I used to be some of the dumbest things. I won that in a in a lightning round. 
that mm-hmm. lightning round with Cindy. I remember her. One yeah. time I was doing it and I was in the lightning round and a fly or a mosquito, something flew up my nose. Oh, wow. And I jumped up and ran behind the screen to because it flew straight up my nose. And I jumped up and ran behind the screen. They let her do it again, but I could not get this fly out my nose. And just thinking, I got a face full of makeup, got my makeup on, everything, and the flies up my nose. But uh, yeah, I love doing those shows. I did those shows with everybody from Richard Simmons, Sally Field. Sally used to say she didn't want to do them without me. And I was good at it. I was good at it. Yeah, we, you were. I saw the clip. Three on, three on Saturday, two on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And they run them all week. I did Password. What, what, uh, hmm. Yeah, I was about to ask you any any more. I did Hollywood Squares. I did Couch Potato. I did um, Win, Lose, or Draw. Mm-hmm. At one point, I got sick of seeing myself. I did that. <laughs> it was just, I mean, because it was so many. You know, they run those five days a week, and then Amen was on. And yeah. I just got tired. I was just, uh, but I was good at that. One time after I went back to Florida, they called me to come back out and do a, a game show. So it was a password to come back out. And I and mm-hmm. I, when Loser Draw was one of my favorites. Because that's mm-hmm. another you, you know, game when you draw the things and people have to guess what you're drawing. That was one yeah. of my favorites. Hollywood Squares, I, one of the uh, main regrets in my life is that I did Hollywood Squares one time with Phyllis Diller and Vincent Price, and I didn't have a camera. Mm-hmm. Oh. Phyllis Diller and Vincent Price. And Captain and Tennille, and red, 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 red buttons. Mm-hmm. All these wonderful old actors. I didn't have a camera. I had one, but you know we didn't carry them around on our phones. Right, right, right. Yeah, I met uh, an animation legend, uh, Floyd Norman, when he came to Essence for his documentary. And I'm just a sucky millennial because I'm not good at Sophie, so I got a Sophie, but it's blurry. I was like, I hope I get him again so I can take a clear one. You hate it when you get you get the selfie and you walk away and it's blurry and you go, tell God, I'm never gonna see him again. Yeah, I wish I could. A friend of mine took a picture of me, and who was it? Oh, you remember? I don't know if you know in New York when the uh, ships come in and the Navy, the boys in in the white suits yeah, come yeah. in. We used to always get, have a pack of them in the theater, and you could always see these rows and rows of white suits. And there were three fine young men in front of the <laughs> theater. And I handed the camera to my friend, Julia. And I said, you got to take this picture because these men are gorgeous. And they got in the middle of them. She took the picture and we walked away and the men walked away. And I looked at the picture and I said, Julia, you can't even see me in this picture. Where am I? It was blurred all across my face. Oh, wow. But yeah. Can you still get to see the men though? Huh? <laughs> No, they were blue. But I mean, it was uh, I was gone. I, all the white had washed me out, and the blue just went right across my face. I was gone. <sighs> so, what do you hope for people to remember about you, your career, and your legacy? I hope that they remember that I made them smile. Mm-hmm. I hope they remember that I made them feel good. I made yeah. them feel entertained. I made them feel comfortable. And then I'm just, they think of me as just being a good person. Yeah. Without all, even all the entertainment, just being a good human being. Right. That's what I hope. I hope everybody that walks away from me, the last thing they felt from me was kindness. Because I pride myself in being kind. Somebody asked me, do I get upset? My daughter-in-law asked me, she said, mom, you never get upset. And I said, I do. I said, I have, but I don't anymore because it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And there's not much that's left. There's not much promise with the the conditions that the world is in right now. If I didn't believe in God, I would be upset. Mm -hmm. But I know that uh, we needed to slow down for a minute and stop and take yeah. a look at what we're doing to our country, what we're doing to the earth. Yeah. And what we're doing to each other. Right. Maybe just, you know, pause for a minute. Mm-hmm. Pause for the cause. Pause for the cause, baby. That's right. So how can people follow you? They can follow me on I mean, like the gram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gotta get the lingo. I'm um, Arluna Ryan on the gram. Um, 
And I, I don't tweet much because mm-hmm. I don't think anybody's interested in what I'm doing every two seconds in my life. <laughs> and I'm not interested in reading what everybody else is doing. Like, today I'm cooking, I'm riding my bike, I'm doing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and Facebook. They okay. can find me there. They can go to my website, rosryan.com, mm-hmm. and uh, they can meet me in Long Beach whale watching, which I do Ooh. a lot. I do that a lot. And they can just, uh, Stay tuned. I'll be back somewhere. All right. So everybody out there, I would like you to like. So I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Seal the Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I will see you in the next video. Peace. Boom.